Well, it's significant that we're here talking about poverty and there is enough in our society. And I think uh, that's very true. Uh, Robert Reich says it best when he says, we're still one of the richest nations in the country, or in the world, and yet we have extreme economic inequality. In fact, we probably have economic inequality as great as it was in post-Civil War times, if not greater. Now, how did we get to this situation uh, with growing poverty and economic inequality? Well, there are, it's a complex story that would take hours and lectures to do, but one of the factors, I think, and Robert Rice certainly is an economist and a political scientist and former chair of Common Cause, uh, handles it well, that there's a connection between the political process, democracy in this country, and, and this growing economic inequality. I began getting interested in it back in 19, the 1990s. What I saw happening was we were losing every time when a vote came up in terms of housing, social services, that kind of thing. So the safety net was becoming more and more frayed as early as the 90s. And uh, you, you began to look at that. And, and then some writers and people began to say, well, let's take a look at uh, what's happening in the political process. You had this growing contributions to campaigns. Television was one of the, television ads were one of the driving forces, of course, but it just kind of snowballed. And then when Congress attempted right after Nixon's uh, impeachment in the late 70s or the mid 70s, there was an effort to put some stops on campaign at the national level but the courts with a case like Buckley versus Vallejo equated free speech with spending of money. So you had to kind of go around that. We, we began to look at it more and more locally here in Cincinnati and saw that council races were skyrocketing. Some people spending as much as $300,000, $250,000. There was an early effort to put some legislation in, in place and actually an amendment had to be passed, a charter amendment that gave the power to the city to do something about campaign reform because it wasn't initially in the home rule charter. So we played around with that and finally got council to pass a contribution limits or, uh, ordinance in the 90s, which then got rescinded uh, in 1998 so that gathered the League of Women Voters and a lot of reformers like myself got very interested in we better do a charter amendment. So for three years we built a you know 20 organization coalition. That's the other thing. If we're going to take on reform and politics, it better be coalition building and citizen building because we're not going to get too much help from the establishment because they, they kind of like the way things are. So it really has to be a citizen pushed effort. So as I say, as, as early as the 90s, we, we were beginning to see this, this disconnect between average people and their needs and especially people who had economic and social needs, uh, the poor, the homeless, the ill housed. So we began to try to convince more and more groups that not just fighting on each individual piece of legislation that came up that affected their group like affordable housing. They needed to get in the fray in terms of reforming the political system. So we had success in 2001 where we passed a, a charter, city charter amendment that had uh, contribution limits. It had public financing. Public financing is one of the effective ways of putting some brakes on campaign spending because it does two things. Uh, people sometimes are appalled initially. They say, I don't want my tax dollars being used to finance somebody's campaign. But in a sense, it puts them in charge because instead of the Koch brothers spending uh, tons of money uh, like they're spending as of today in Ohio, they, 
put about $30 million into Rob Portman's campaign against Strickland. Um, public financing, you can put, if somebody accepts public financing, you can put a lid on campaign spending. You can uh, require a certain amount of grassroots funding before somebody gets the public financing. So public financing is one of the critical reforms. It's not a silver bullet, but it does do a lot toward reforming the political process. What's come along since 2010, however, is Citizens United, which was a major Supreme Court case, five to four decision, that gave literally groups that said they weren't part of an actual campaign carte blanche to spend almost unlimited, actually unlimited amounts of money to either trash a candidate or promote an issue. And they, you could call that as separate from a campaign. And so that's going on as we speak in these current campaigns. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have these big organizations that don't profess to be part of their campaigns, but they are indeed putting millions of dollars into the situation. So we're up against kind of a Sisyphean, the myth of Sisyphus rolling rocks up the hill as reformers. It's a kind of a daunting situation today in terms of reformers taking it on, but we've got to convince more and more people who have been suffering because of what the state legislature, because of what Congress, even city council, Alice Skirts in her book points out very vividly what's happened in Over the Rhine and others have done it as well. So it's local, state, and federal. The thing about a city like Cincinnati is it's also subject to huge cuts in federal funds. It's subject to huge cuts in state funds in terms of the safety net. So both of those have taken tremendous hits. One thing that you can't prove, there isn't a quid pro quo. So it isn't like, okay, we can go after David Koch because he's directly given money to pass this legislation. It's much more subtle than that now. I mean, it isn't very subtle. If somebody puts millions of dollars into your campaign, but it, it's not, well, I'm just doing it because I believe in the candidate. It's not a payoff for a particular piece of legislation. But nevertheless, if you look at what scholars and performers have looked at, at the state and local and federal level, you have this compute, complete kind of withdrawal of many politicians from dealing with what average people are dealing with. And I would even say we're moving very much in the direction of a plutocracy. I know people will throw up their hands and say, oh, come on, we still have a democratic process. But when you have that much money power, then you're moving in the way of plutocracy. And Robert Reich does a very neat thing in his latest book where he, he shows that plutocracy leads to economic inequality. And so I think it's very fitting that this particular forum is, is wrestling with these bigger issues like money and politics and other issues that have these huge impacts on what our public life is all about. Because that's what we really need to be getting back to is a, a more healthy democracy in public life. And so that's why I think it's more and more important for all of us to working together, uh, not only to save a particular program like affordable housing, but to reform the democratic process because that's what's gotten affordable housing in the dire straits that it is today. Uh, we also have to have a little humor when we're dealing with reform because it is such a daunting process. I'm going to leave with a, a little political spoof that I did uh, a few years back. It's called a new kind of safety net. Current politicians have found their niche by building a safety net for the rich. Instead of worrying about the poor, help moneyed folks amass some more. For a person of wealth is a job creator, even if that job is below the equator. The working poor spends all they've got, but a rich consumer might buy a yacht. 
Fat cats treat you to fine champagnes and spend a billion, billion on your campaigns. Well, that's, that's a silly spoof in, in a way, but in a way it portrays what the heck's been going on in terms of our political process. And some of the major side effects, such as this growing economic inequality in our midst. So if we're gonna take it seriously, we have to get down to brass tacks and fix our systems. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs>